This is a picture um, from about 1990. This is the same rough spot in 2011. You see a much smaller colony. Adelies tend to come back to the same colony. So the same adults will come back year after year to the same small colony. It's not even the same island. There might be multiple colonies and subcolonies on the island. They're very faithful to that colony. And Scott's going to share data from the Palmer Long-Term Ecological Research Station um, and uh, data from field expeditions, um, autonomous robots and gliders, and satellite remote sensing to help you understand the changing conditions in the Southern Ocean and the Antarctic. Um, Scott's expertise spans oceanography, climate science, and biogeochemistry. His research focuses on how the global carbon cycle and ocean ecosystems respond to both natural and human-driven climate change. Please join me in welcoming Scott. Oops. So I think, can you shut off the podium mic? So can everybody hear me OK with the lapel mic? Stay over here. Um, so as Billy said, I'm going to talk about some work that we've been doing on the Western Antarctic Peninsula. And this is work that's been funded by the National Science Foundation as part of a long-term ecological uh, research program. And the idea here is that in order to understand ecological problems, you need to have a, a context of the variations that happen, not just over a season, not just over a few years, but in many cases over multiple decades. And I've had the great pleasure for the last 10 years to be part of this program that dates back to the early 1990s. And what I'm showing you today is really the accumulation of knowledge and insight uh, gained by many dozens of scientists, technicians, and students. So I, I really get the pleasure of representing all of this work. If you look up on the screen, this gives you an, in one quick overview the stud our study site. In the foreground, you see the research ship. That's the little orange, orange and yellow ship in the front. You see open water. You see sea ice. You see icebergs. And in the back, the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, it's a really fascinating place to work because although we're looking at open ocean questions, uh, the topography is such that sometimes we're only a few miles from towering mountains and towering glaciers. And it's this interaction of the, the near shore and the offshore out into the open ocean that is what's driving a lot of the research that we're doing. So to give you an idea of the Antarctic, one of the things that dominates the processes there is the fact that every winter, the area around the Antarctic is fills up with sea ice. It gets cold enough, gets down where ice forms, it gets moved around by ocean currents, it gets blown around by the winds. But if you look on the left-hand panel, that's the sort of maximum extent of ice. And then over the summer and, and in, into the early fall, all that ice tends to melt. There's almost no ice left most years. There's a little bit of ice to the east of the peninsula. The peninsula is, sticks out, juts out towards South America. So there's a little bit of ice to the east of the peninsula, but our study region to the western side of the peninsula often is ice-free for a good part of the summer. And so as that ice forms and melts, it controls the circulation, but it also controls the ecosystem. So in a very simple cartoon, here's a depiction of the ecosystem for the Antarctic. Down at the bottom, you have phytoplankton, the dominant phytoplankton in our region are called diatoms. They're small little cells that build shells out of silicon. And so they have a hard shell. They're fairly large. And they are a, a prey resource for things like krill. Krill are shrimp-like crustaceans, as well as small fish. The krill and the fish are then prey for larger predators. So for example, humpback whales. Uh, many types of seals, and many types of penguins. And one of the things that really uh, encapsulates the Antarctic ecosystem is the richness during that summer period. You have the ice opens up, you have lots of nutrients, 
you have light. It's the, it's the Antarctic summer that goes all, summer, or all day long with sunlight. The diatoms bloom. You get large plankton blooms that are consumed then by predators. And it's a rich resource. So for example, both penguins and whales over the summer use that to build up fat reserves and build up reserves either for the penguins to feed their chicks or for the whales to build up fat reserves that they then can use for the rest of the year when they travel up to the tropics for breeding. So the original idea of the Palmer LTR was, here's this natural laboratory where every year the ice forms and collapses. So you have this strong physical driving factor. You have a relatively simple ecosystem. Could we use that to understand how physical processes drive ocean biology? This is some video that was taken by photographers from Rutgers University as part of a student project. So you're seeing um, humpback whales, now penguins, different species of penguins, elephant seals, crab eater seals, fur seals are all common. There are a variety of different seabirds like skuas and petrels. Um, and I'll just play this one more time when it's over. Um, it's this richness of the ecosystem that is, is, draws many people. So not just scientists, but the region has become quite a tourist uh, an eco-tourist destination. When we put together the LTR team, in order to study the richness of this ecosystem, we need everybody on board, from physicists and chemists to biologists who study plankton, all the way up to biologists that study uh, bird colonies, penguins, and marine mammals. So it's a quite diverse group. Uh, my role in this group, as Billy mentioned, I do a lot of work with satellite remote sensing and numerical modeling. And so the fun part of my job is I get to talk to a bunch of people who spend a lot of more time than I do in the field. I only get to go down every few years. They go down every year. So we deploy our teams early um, in October. So we'll be sending our first team members down in a week or two. And we have people down in the Antarctic through late March or early April. To give you an idea of what life is like down there, um, there are three US bases in the Antarctic. We're working from the smallest base. So this is Palmer Station. So the corrugated metal buildings to the left are Palmer Station. It's occupied all year long by a mix of scientists and logistical crew. Um, so roughly together, the population is about 50 or 60 people. So it's a relatively small base. Um, on your right is the current research, supply, research and supply vessel. It's the Lawrence M. Gould. So everything that has to come to this station, science supplies, people, food, fuel, all comes down on the Gould. It comes down from Chile roughly monthly and will resupply the, the, the station, but then we'll also do expeditions around the peninsula with scientific crew and marine technical crew on the research ship. One of the reasons why the station was set up is right offshore of the station are a series of small islands that are penguin and seabird colonies. So this is a, a, a rich area during the summer. Uh, penguins, in this case Adelie penguins, will come to these islands to breed they will then nest, the eggs will hatch, the penguin chicks will then be fed by their parents, and then eventually they'll fledge. So this is a several month process where the parents, in order to have enough energy to both support themselves and to feed their growing chicks, need a lot of food. And so these colonies aren't spread all the way along the peninsula, they're in a few key places where there appears to be a really rich, robust food source that's been there for a sustained period of time. When some of the first measurements when the station was established, um, some of the early biologists went down, they started counting. That's the first thing you want to do for, for these penguin colonies. How many pairs of penguins are there? How many nests are there? So this data goes back to the early 1970s and is courtesy of Bill Frazier, who's our penguin guy. Um, 
If you're interested, there's actually a, a book called Fraser's Penguins that talks about his life as a natural historian in the Antarctic. Um, what Bill saw was that the, at first there seemed to be a fairly stable and large number of these Adelie penguins. That's the red line. So the red box shows around the Adelie penguin. The Adelie penguin is what we call a polar species. They've evolved over time to live in an ice dominated cold polar environment. Bill's early data started to show some big spikes year to year, and then this long-term decline. So the penguin population went to, from right around Palmer Station from about 15,000 pairs of penguins and is now at about a little under 2,000 pairs. It's been fairly stable uh, the last 10 years or so, slightly declining. We don't know whether it's going to continue to drop. And one of the motivations for the Palmer LTR was to understand, um, particularly over the last two decades, why has this penguin population been declining? Is it changes in ocean physics? Is it changes in sea ice? Is it changes in food? Remember I said that the, these penguin colonies need a very rich, sustained food source? Um, or is it some other factor that we haven't considered yet? One of the other interesting things is as the Adelis have been declining, other penguins have been migrating in and establishing new colonies. So when Bill first started going down, there were only Adelis. But then you'll see in blue are the Chenstrap penguins. They started coming in in the, in the 1980s at a small number, and then they've, they haven't overpopulated, but there's been a gradual increase in Chenstraps. And then in green, the Gentoos, uh, have been coming in and they've really skyrocketed up. Now they're slightly different scales. The Gentoos and the Chinstraps haven't re fully replaced the Adelis. There's now about roughly 3,000 breeding pairs of Gentoos. But what we're seeing is this replacement of this polar species of penguins, the Adelis, by a more subpolar, a warmer climate penguin, in this case the, the Gentoos, are really doing much better than the Adelis. So that's some background and some motivation from our study. You know, why is this change happening? Can we associate it to changes in physics? Can we associate it to changes in biology? Um, the way we've been monitoring this ecosystem has two components. Uh, the first is we work out of uh, Palmer Station. So on the map here, this red dot on Anvers Island is the location of Palmer Station. Um, from Palmer Station, we can get out in small Zodiac boats and now some rigid hull boats. Uh, so we can go out you know, a few miles to tens of miles from the base. We can sample water conditions. So we profile the water column by putting down bottle, lowering a, a, an instrument over the side and collecting water samples and also making electronic measurements through the water column. Uh, we can also survey the local penguin colonies, making measure, measurements of the number of penguins, but also their diet, how big they are, how big the chicks are, when do the chicks fledge, uh, and all sorts of other um, uh, population dynamics information. And then we also come down on the research ship. So the, the Palmer work, the station work occurs all season from October into late March or early April, depending on weather. Or a little going out on an icy day or a windy day in a zodiac is not allowed. So we can't always get out to station. And then the other thing is we go down and we do a research expedition every January and February. Right now it's on the Gould. And we look offshore. So we start at Palmer Station. And then we do a grid of stations that extends out about 100 miles from the coast and about 300 miles to the south. And we look at other penguin colonies, and we also look at what's going on in the water column. Can we document changes in krill, phytoplankton, uh, physics, uh, large-scale pattern changes that might inform us about what's going on at the penguin colonies along the peninsula? So I just want to show um, this movie. It's actually quite hard to get to Palmer. 
There's no airfield. There's no plane service. There's no helicopter service. The only way to get there is on a relatively small ship, and that ship has to cross the Drake Passage. So this is one of the windiest, stormiest places on the planet. And so this was um, a few years ago when we were going down. Um, the few of us who were still standing <laughs> would go out on the, on the aft deck or up to the bridge um, to take movies. Um, it's a great boat for working around the Antarctic Peninsula. It's a little rough sometimes getting down there. So I had mentioned that we're interested in change. So what are the factors, what are the physical factors, the climate factors that we might be interested in? Um, this was a, a schematic that was put together by the National Climate Assessment several years ago, and it, it puts into cartoon form a huge amount of observational data that's been collected on various aspects of Earth's climate. And these are all things that we have solid observational evidence that are changing over time and that are predicted would also change as a function of global warming and climate change. So if you, I'm going to focus mostly over on the left-hand side, the ocean side of this panel. So on the left-hand side, you see, for example, ocean warming. So the surface of the ocean is warming, but also the subsurface of the ocean. The total amount of heat in the ocean is increasing. So when we talk about global warming, roughly about 90% of the extra heat that the planet has absorbed is actually in the ocean. So the ocean is beneficial in that it's a huge heat sink. It takes a lot to heat up, heat up water. It takes a lot of energy to heat up water. But you've also, you're changing the ocean over long periods of time by adding all of this additional heat. And then the other is sea ice. And you may have seen a lot, it's been in the news, changes in the Arctic, the Arctic is opening up. People are now uh, have ice-free conditions during the summer for exploration, potentially for fishing at some point, also for transit. And the same thing is happening along the peninsula, but perhaps for slightly different reasons. We're seeing substantial sea ice loss. I'm not gonna go into it in this talk, but if you look over on the right, uh, you also see decline in ice sheets and glaciers. And along the peninsula, <laughs> roughly about 90% of the glaciers are shrinking with time. And so we do see calving a lot more icebergs, a lot more glacier ice is getting into the, getting into the coastal region. The full implications of that we're still trying to figure out. So I'm gonna show a few data slides about some of these climate trends to show you that the cartoon, while it looks really pretty, hides a lot of the details. So on here in the upper left is showing a map of the Antarctic, and the color codes show the long-term trends. So red are warming trends, and blue are cooling trends. So particularly along the peninsula, and then, and then a little west of the peninsula into the Bellinghausen and Amundsen Sea, uh, you see lots of warming. Um, other parts of the continent are actually cooling. And there are, different, there, there, there are different regional patterns that are affecting both sea ice and biology. So the whole continent isn't, isn't experiencing the same climate change. The graph at the, at the bottom is showing uh, winter temperatures from the Faraday station. It used to be a British station, it's now called Verdansky because it was transferred to the Ukrainians. It's fairly close to Palmer and it has a long uh, climate meteorological record going back to the 1950s. And there's two things I want you to notice about this. First is that there's a long-term warming trend. It used to be quite cold in the winter. Uh, these are in degrees Celsius, so we're looking at you know, average winter temperatures, maybe minus 10, minus 15 degrees Celsius. It's warmed up quite a bit. When you're in the Antarctic, you got warm is a relative term. Um, you know, I remember one day somebody's like, "Wow, look at that warm surface water," and it was minus one <laughs> Celsius. But, um, th but the other is early on, not only was it cold, but there was huge swings from year to year. 
So it was a dry, cold, polar climate that experienced large variability because it was mostly icebound. And so you could get these huge cold events that would set in, and there was nothing to moderate them. If you look towards the right, not only is it warmer, but the variability is reduced. And some of that reduced variability is because there's now open water closer to the station. The ocean's a big heat sink, and it's, it's more a maritime climate. And the maritime climate tends to damp out some of the larger winter variations. So the second climate record that's of real major importance is sea ice. I had mentioned that sea ice is declining. One of the ways we look at that is, if you remember back to that first picture of the continent where there was a lot of ice during winter and, and low ice during the summer, at any location you can say, you know, what day of the year does ice start to form? And at what day of the year does the ice disappear? And that duration, it might be a month in one location, it might be six months, it might be 10 months. That ice duration has been reduced over time around the peninsula. And that's what the color code in the map in the upper left is showing declines over time uh, over this, this ice season. So ice isn't showing up in the fall as early as it used to, and it's disappearing sooner in the spring. Uh, and then the graph is showing that the ice has been declining, and then actually for the last few years, the ice has been going up. And we're still trying to understand, is that some natural variability signal? Is that some aspect of the interaction with the global climate um, that hasn't been fully, fully worked out? Now, one of the interesting things, when I first, you know, when you first see this, the temperatures are warming, there's less ice. You think, oh, there's enough, enough warmth that it's melting the ice. It's actually a little bit more complicated than that because you also have to factor in wind. So ice can form and melt locally, but you can also have wind that blows ice around. And so if you look at the year-to-year -year variations of ice, the biggest factor is wind direction. So in the Antarctic, you have winds that blow from the west, and the winds actually circle the continent. So these are the, the roaring 40s, the roaring 50s are these westerly winds that circle the continent. Um, those have been strengthening with time, and there's actually been, there's a slight wobble. So sometimes you get a year where the winds are from the west to the mostly, but you have a northerly component. So for example, on the panel on the left, that's a low ice year. If you can see the little, the, the little gray arrows, when you get a northerly wind, it brings warmer air, and it actually pushes the ice down the peninsula away from our study region. The converse happens in the right, a big ice year, where you have more southerly winds. And that actually brings ice. We get ice for much of the summer. And it also brings colder temperatures. So this combination of changing winds leads to both changing temperatures and also changing ice. So that's physics. Let me give you uh, shift gears here a little bit and start looking at biology. So we know a lot about ocean biology, both from field observations, but also from satellite measurements. Um, and one of the things I work on is I work on uh, satellites that are called ocean color sensors. And they actually look at the color at different light bands, so like red, green, blue bands in the visible. And when you have a lot of phytoplankton, in the water, the water's a different color because the pigments that the phytoplankton are using absorb light, and they absorb it differentially in different wavelength bands. So you can actually look when you see very clear blue water, the you know, picture of off of Hawaii where you have that really dark blue water. It's dark blue because there's very little life in that water. There's very little phytoplankton. And if you look more in coastal waters, the water looks more, more greenish. That's a reflection of how much biomass or how much pigment is there. And so we can use that from space to map out phytoplankton distributions. And that's what's shown here in the upper left in a, in a false color satellite image that's been put together from many individual scenes. And 
the dark blues and purples are low levels of biomass. And then the blues, light blues into greens and then into yellows and reds are high biomass. And there's a band of moderate level biomass all the way around the Southern Ocean. Um, so you have lots of nutrients there. And even though you have a lot of chlorophyll, you actually have less than you would expect because there's lots of nutrients, the things you would pour on your plants at home <coughs> in the garden. What you don't have is iron. We don't often think of iron when you're growing in a soil as a nutrient, but it's an essential component of cells. They need it for their enzymes. You can't, you can't do photosynthesis and energy transfer in a cell without iron. And when you get far away from the continents, far away from sediments, far away from dust plumes, there's not a lot of iron. One of the big discoveries when Billy and I were graduate students was the importance of iron. We were actually joking about it at dinner. It's very hard to measure iron in the ocean when you're on a steel ship. And so it was a multi-decade effort to really refine those measurements. And one of the reasons we think very close to the continent that you get the very high, the yellows and the oranges, is because there's iron coming off the continents, either dissolving out of the sediments or coming down with the glaciers and, the ice, and, and then the subsequent icebergs. The glaciers are actually grinding, eroding away the continent, eroding rock that has iron in it, and dumping iron and other trace metals into the coastal waters. The bottom panel shows the long-term record from Palmer Station. The gray bands are ice, and the green is the amount of, of pigment. So each one of, the, each one of those little green bars is made up of many, many weekly trips out in a zodiac to collect sur surface samples where then uh, pigments were measured. And what you see is that although there's a phytoplankton bloom, a big spike every year, sometimes the spike is five or 10 times higher in some years than in other years. And this variability is tied to how much ice is there. Um, some years you get ice that, that either retreats earlier or um, it retreats in such a way that it makes the water column more stable and is conducive to these blooms. And just to give you a sense that this isn't just an effect at the station, uh, this is some satellite ocean color data. Uh, these are individual years in the animation and you'll see blooms pop up in different parts of the peninsula, um, big patches of yellow and red. This is actually on a log scale. So there's between the blues and the orange, oranges and reds, there's about a factor of 100 in how much biomass there is. So you see along the continental shelf on the peninsula, you get these uh, strong blooms, but there's a lot of variability year to year, which is tied into these ice, in, into the ice conditions. We can now take these satellite records and look long term what's happening over multiple decades. Right? So we have data that's fairly localized or collected from a ship. Remember, ships don't move very fast. One of my friends likes to joke that uh, a ship moves about the speed of a 10 speed of a 10 speed bicycle. So we're trying to survey. It takes us about a month and a half to do our survey grid, and we get to do it once. And, but we can tie it in with satellite data. Every time there's a cloud-free image, we can collect data and put our ship data in context. And what you're seeing here on the left is roughly 20 years of satellite data looking at long-term trends. Uh, the yellows and oranges are places where phytoplankton has been increasing with time. And the blues and greens are places where it's been declining. Uh, the red dot is Palmer Station, so our, our linchpin station is right sort of at the hinge point where things to the north of the peninsula have been declining and things to the south have been increasing. And we were really intrigued by this because at first we showed that the ice, you know, every place is warming, the ice is retreating everywhere. Why would you get biology increasing in some places and decreasing the other, in, in other places? And the hypothesis that we're working on, I, I'd say it's still a hypothesis, um, is that the system was primed in different ways. In the north, you used to get these very strong blooms. Uh, this is the upper panel, uh, the, the upper row here. 
So the North had a fair amount of ice that would form every winter. It would melt. When it melts, it adds fresh water to the ocean. So the ocean is pretty dense because of the salt. You add fresh water, and the fresh water is actually lighter. And so it makes the surface of the ocean lighter and more stable. And so phytoplankton love to live in a nice, stable up, upper part of the water column because they're, they're able to get a lot of sunlight. Sunlight drops off quickly in the ocean. So if you have a lot of mixing, the phytoplankton spend too much time in the dark, so they don't grow well. So if you stabilize the water column by melting ice, you prime the pump for making a really big bloom. And what's happened is, as the ice has disappeared in the north, there's not as much fresh water. It's actually gotten windier. And things aren't as conducive. There, there's deep mixing, the phytoplankton. They still bloom, but they aren't doing as well. In the south, there used to be very low phytoplankton levels because there was so much ice that things were light limited. There was a very small growing season where the ice had melted back. And so what we think is that in the south now, you're getting big blooms that looks a lot like what the north used to look like. And so you have this climate migration that's occurring down the peninsula. So what used to be big blooms in the north are migrating south because the ice conditions are migrating south. And so one of the things is, well, how does that affect the rest of the ecosystem? There was a really nice seminal paper, not by our group, um, by Atkinson about a decade ago that looked at zooplankton. So zooplankton feed on the small phytoplankton, and they're the inter intermediary between you know, the microscopic world and the big fa um, ocean fauna, seabirds, whales, seals, uh, that we're used to seeing. So he looked in particular at two types of zooplankton, krill, which is in, the, op, in, in the, the upper panel. Krill look a, a lot like a shrimp. They're related. They're crustaceans. Uh, they're a long-lived species in the Antarctic. Uh, they create huge swarms, massive swarms of krill that are then food for, for other animals. And Atkinson looked at the long-term trends going back many decades. And what he saw in the, in the upper panel is places where you see red, are actually places where the amount of krill had declined with time. So the upper part of the peninsula into the Scotian, Scotian Sea, the same place where our data suggests there's less ice and less phytoplankton, are where he's seeing less krill. Uh, the other species in the, in the bottom is a salp. It's a gelatinous filter feeder. Think of it as a, a little gelatinous vacuum that basically filters up everything that's there. Um, Salps like warmer water. They also like ice-free conditions. They don't actually, they're filter feeders, but if the bloom gets too intense, they actually start to clog up and they don't do as well. And in the blue, there are places where the data suggests that salps are actually increasing. So you're replacing krill, which is a really wonderful, nutritious food, with this gelatinous mess. Uh, one of the worst things that happens is if you're towing for zooplankton, and you hit a swarm of salps, your net can come up. And you literally have to ha harness somebody in and lean them over the side with a bucket, because there will be so much of these gelatinous salps, you have to just scoop them out of the net, uh, because we can't winch the net up on board. So long-term trends that look very similar to what we're seeing for phytoplankton. Now, do we see that at, at, our, at our Palmer Station data? The answer is maybe. Um, we have a much shorter record. There's a lot of variability. We do see some krill increasing in the south, where we see the increases in phytoplankton. Um, but at our station, which was at that hinge point between you know, basically neutral in terms of changes in phytoplankton, we don't see a, a lot of, of, of a, a, lo a large long-term trend. We do see these big spikes. And we see them both in uh, net tows. We tow for zooplankton. Um, and we also see them, one of the other things that our penguin biologists do is they collect diet samples from the adult penguins. So the, uh, it actually can be quite, kind of humorous. 
So the penguin, the penguin parents have been foraging out in the ocean. They come back to the colony, and, and a scientist then tries to net the penguin. Um, penguins can move very, very fast, particularly if they're on snow, because they'll drop onto their bellies and they'll scoot away from you. Um, we collect a small diet sample. We also weigh the penguins. Um, and the diet sample, we can tell not only what are they eating, are they eating krill, or are they eating fish? We can see the size of the krill. So we can use the penguins as basically sampling devices to see what the, the zooplankton are doing with time. We can also collect um, fish otoliths, the little, uh, the little ear bones, and see if, if they've been eating fish as well. And both the nets and the diets indicated these big events. And it turned out that the events that we saw where you have big krill years lag by a year or two big phytoplankton blooms. And so the hypothesis that one of our, uh, one of actually one of our students came up with, which I just thought was, was brilliant, was she was able to show that you, when you had these big ice years, you had then big phytoplankton blooms because the ice melted, stabilized the water column. The krill are always breeding, but their breeding success depends a lot on how much food there is. So in years when you have a lot of phytoplankton, you get a lot more juveniles that survive into the winter. The ice is also good for the krill. The, the juvenile krill actually hide out underneath the ice over the winter. And so on the left-hand side, when you have a big ice year, it's followed in a year or two by a big krill year. And you actually see that in the size classes of the krill, that the, you'll, you'll have only adults and no juveniles, and then you'll have this big recruitment event, and you'll have all these juveniles that have been brought into the population. Krill can live a long time. They're ad adapted also to this ice environment. They can live for five or six years as adults and actually can wait out a bad ice year or two. Uh, and then on the right-hand side is a bad ice year where fewer krill, fewer juveniles, fewer phytoplankton. So uh, I, Billy mentioned, um, you know, we were both trained as chemists. I got to put in a couple of chemistry sides. It's obligatory. I know chemistry is not as exciting as penguins and whales, but bear with me for a second. So one of the things I work on is the global carbon cycle. So atmospheric carbon dioxide has been going up for the last 200 years or so, driven by changes in agriculture and also by fossil fuel emissions. You know, when you drive a car, that gasoline that you put into the tank is actually turned into carbon dioxide gas through combustion. And most of it, about half of it, stays in the atmosphere. But some fraction of it dissolves in the ocean. The ocean is, has a high alkalinity because of all the salts and the weathering of the continents. So it's actually a very good absorber of carbon dioxide. When you add carbon dioxide to water, it actually reacts with water and forms carbonic acid. So the more carbon dioxide that gets in the ocean, the more acidic the water gets. And this is a particular concern for polar regions because you have organisms that build shells out of calcium carbonate so on the left-hand panel are showing, uh, these are called pteropods. They're small little planktonic marine mollusks. And in the upper panel is a shell grown at normal seawater conditions. It's nicely shaped, it's smooth. But if the water is made more acidic by adding carbon dioxide, you get the bottom panel. The shell gets rough, it starts to fall apart. Sometimes they'll be malformed. Um, so for some of these organisms that build shells out of calcium carbonate, it can be quite important what the water chemistry is. And on the, the right, maybe a little bit more detail than you want to know, are our long-term measurements. And we're starting to see some of these acidic conditions showing up. So we haven't yet seen big impacts on the ecosystem like we have for warming and changes in sea ice. But this is something that we're monitoring with time. Now, Billy mentioned that um, our group, and particularly some of the folks down at Rutgers, are pioneering some new ocean technologies. So 
Ships are expensive. Um, we can't be everywhere at the same time. We can't be there for lots of the year. Uh, but ocean robots can help fill in some of those gaps. Satellites are great, but you can't measure everything from a satellite. And the satellite only sees the ocean surface. So this, uh, the, the, yellow, um, the, the yellow instrument that's in the water is what's called an ocean glider. It's a torpedo shaped with wings and a little tail. Um, it moves roughly about a walking speed, and it moves by changing its buoyancy from going heavier than the water so it sinks, and then it uses its wings to glide and uses the rudder to glide in a particular direction. And then when it gets to a preset depth, it decreases its buoy or increases its buoyancy um, and then can rise up. And we can actually, these can deploy for days or even weeks at a time and can make profile measurements just like we would from a ship. For the Antarctic, we need something that we can deploy out. If we can't recover right away, it'll survive. Um, the nice thing about the gliders, too, is that they're uh, small enough, particularly these gliders, that we can deploy from a small, either from the ship or from a small boat. <coughs> Excuse me. So to give you an idea of where we're going with this, um, on the left-hand side are some of the major penguin colonies. So the top one is the one right on Anvers Island where Palmer Station is. The dark red shows the foraging region for the penguins. These are Adeli penguins. Uh, we know where they're foraging because we can attach satellite tags to them. So we'll, we'll catch a penguin, put a tag on, they'll go off onto a foraging event. We can track where they are, how deep in the water column, how much time they're spending at the surface versus diving, um, the temperature of the water. When they come back, we take the, t the tag off. And so we have a good idea of where they're foraging and how that changes from year to year and over the season. Um, the dark red show the foraging for three colonies that we're studying down the peninsula. And you can see that they're only foraging in a few, you know, few tens of kilometers for, from their colony. So these colonies are established in places where there's a rich enough food supply dependably that they can go out, collect the food they need, not expend too much energy, and then come back and feed their chicks. Since we know where they're foraging from the satellite tags, we can, do, we can then direct the gliders. We can put gliders in. So the right-hand side is showing a vertical profile of both temperature and chlorophyll from a glider. We can actually go out and sample where the penguins are feeding. Um, some of the newer gliders will actually have acoustic instruments that will also tell us how much krill there are. And so we can combine these technologies and get a much better picture of what's going on. So I wanted to just dig back to the penguins. As I had said, we started with the hypothesis that maybe the krill is disappearing. And that's what's driving the decline in Adelis. They're breeding on these islands. This is a, an island quite close to, um, to Palmer Station. This is a picture um, from about 1990. This is the same rough spot in 2011. You see a much smaller colony. Adelis tend to come back to the same colony. So the same adults will come back year after year to the same small colony. It's not even the same island. There might be multiple colonies and subcolonies on the island. They're very faithful to that colony. And so we can track the size of the population, not at the, at the big level, but even at these colony levels. The other things is that the Adelis, you'll notice uh, here that where the Adelis are nesting, they're feeding on krill. Um, krill are little crustaceans. So penguin poop is red because of their diet. And so we can use the number of nests, but also that background, uh, if you like, poop cloud <laughs> to give us a sense for the, 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 the number of, of penguins. So another uh, group within our, within our project uh, from Duke and from uh, now UC Santa Cruz are using aerial drones 
that can be launched either from shore or from a small boat to survey penguins, seals, and whales. And this expands our capability because they can cover a, a wide area fairly quickly. So I'll just show another video. Uh, this is Dave Johnston launching a small drone. Some of them look like copters, and this one is a, actually a small airplane. So he launches the drone, and then the drone will map the entire island. And once we've mapped the island, we have visual data, we also have GPS data, so a very a, a three-dimensional map. We can then, this is a virtual reality uh, flyby of the island from this model. You can actually see the penguin colonies, those dark red, uh, and you can actually see the individual penguins. Um, so we can count uh, the number of penguins quite quickly uh, and also map the different subcolonies. And for some of the regions where we can't get there very often, um, it's very hard to map the entire island by walking and counting individually. This expands our capabilities quite dramatically. So I want to just mention a couple other hypotheses for why penguins might be declining. So I had said that the Adelis are declining and the Gentoos are going up. One of the differences between Adelis and Gentoos is that Adelis, not only do they come back to the same colony, but the, their timing, they've evolved in this harsh polar environment with a, a very narrow window. You have to breed at a particular time, there needs to be food. Uh, for when, the, when the eggs hatch, there's not a lot of flexibility in their behavior. And that's been an, a, a successful adaptive strategy for many centuries to millennia. We have data on penguin colonies in the prehistoric because all of that poop in those nests, you can actually drill back down and see how long a colony's been there. And we can also find extinct colonies um, and document when they were occupied based on the nesting and the, 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 the poop. Now, one of the problems is that we've moved from this cold polar climate to more of a warmer maritime climate. You're from Boston. What does it do during the winter? It snows. Yeah, sorry. I kind of gave it away by the picture. Um, the Antarctic is primarily a desert. There's actually low precipitation. It gets cold enough. There's just not, not a lot of moisture. This warmer maritime uh, subpolar air, you will get snow events. And this was a, a fairly catastrophic snow event about a decade and a half ago, where the, the uh, Adelis were already there, they were already nesting, they had laid their eggs, snow came along, and when that snow melted, it actually flooded a lot of the nests. So it drowned the eggs, um, and we had a, a huge loss. And what was interesting is we could look, and this is Bill Fraser's work, he could look at individual parts of the island, these little subcolonies. Remember, they're, they're faithful to their subcolony. So the northern part of the island perhaps didn't get as much snow. The wind might have blown off the snow, and it ended up on the south side of the island. And he can see that the subcolonies that got more snow fared worse over time. And so a second hypothesis is that it's not just changes in krill. It's, it's, it's snow. It's a changing the, changing the rules. The Adelis evolved for a certain set of rules, and now we're changing the rules on them. A third hypothesis is that the system that we started looking at, you know, that Bill started looking at in the 1970s, wasn't a natural system. And one of the biggest factors is we harvested huge numbers of whales from the Southern Ocean. Um, the best estimates are roughly, uh, roughly 2 million whales of a whole variety of different species were taken out of the Southern Ocean. So whales, has anybody seen Finding Nemo? What do whales eat? <laughs> whales eat krill, right? Um, so perhaps there's actually more krill now for the penguins because the whales disappeared. Now the whales are coming back. Some of the whale species are, are, are expanding with time. And maybe the decline in the Adelis is simply that their competitors, the whales, are now coming back to uh, 
pre-industrial levels. And just to give you an idea of that, I put the red dot where Palmer is. This is for fin and blue whales. Um, we don't see any fin or blue whales. We haven't documented fin or blue whales near Palmer Station in 30 years of data. They're just, the whales we see are humpbacks, which are, are, um, are, are, are coming back. But we harvested hundreds in each of these grid cells, whales. And this is data that was gone back to individual whaling ships, documented their catch, but also where it was caught. And so even now, when some of the humpbacks are coming back, it's still not the system. It's not the pre-industrial natural ecosystem. So this is, this is we, in, in ecology, we call this the shifting baseline paradigm. That whenever you got out of graduate school and started doing field research, that's the natural system. And then it changes <laughs> from there. But we've learned that that's not true, that many ecosystems around the world were already heavily perturbed before we started studying them scientifically. Um, just a few more and then we'll stop and take questions. One of the other things that the Duke community is doing is a huge amount of work on marine mammals. Now, I gotta be careful, I'm a chemist, I'm now way up at whales, so, um, but I'm just reporting some of the, the work they're doing. Um, they sampled a number of whales, they can collect biopsy samples from the whales and they can use genetic methods to track in individual whales and whale populations. They can also use the biop biopsy samples um, to see the, the gender ratio, male versus female, how many females are pregnant. And now with some of the drones where you can get aerial pictures of the whales, you can see the size of the whale. And so uh, I like the contrast between the top picture for summer and the bottom picture for fall. Um, over the summer, the whales are actually putting on huge amounts of, of, of mass. That's why they're in, in the Antarctic. They're in the Antarctic to feed because the ecosystem is so rich. And you go from a, a, a thin little whale to a, a potato whale. Um, <laughs> but they need that energy source because then they're gonna go up. This population actually breeds and calves up off of Panama and the, in, in that um, uh, west of Central America. And they often don't feed. They're going to transit and spend the time up there without feeding. So they need to put on all that energy. So I'll just wrap up with two last slides. Um, we, we, we have to go back to our program managers and program managers love you know, cartoons. So we put together this pretty <laughs> color cartoon. Um, it's a little complicated, but one of our working ideas, if you look down at the bottom right, is that this is the way the world used to be. It was a polar system. You only had a delis. Things were cold. You had cold water. You had fish. Um, and that as the system has warmed up with, over time, the delis are di declining. You're getting these new penguin species coming in. You're getting humpback whales, which don't really like ice a lot, but they love the krill. And so over time, we're seeing this shift. And by studying down the peninsula, we can actually see what conditions, not, not just at one point, the time slice, but are things shifting with time down the whole peninsula. So we're using, in some ways, space as a trade-off for time. You know, we don't have, we can't go back and collect data from the 1970s, but maybe we can use um, go further south to see, is that what the system used to look like? And then finally, if you're interested, um, the Rutgers Film School uh, a few years ago sent down a photographer and a director onto our month and a half long research expedition. And then the students from the film school put that all together, added interviews, and made a feature length film. And what I like about this film is that it talks about the science, but it also gives you some sense of what life is like as a field-going oceanographer trapped on the same ship with the same 30 people for a month and a half. So it's a little bit of, a little bit of the people dynamics as well as the science. So I'll stop there, and Billy will help me, uh, and we'll take questions.
we have time for some questions for Scott. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, um, are the are the Gen twos being opportunistic and exploring a new niche, or are they actually migrating because it was too warm where they were? And, and what is the diet of the Gen twos? So, uh, um, the Gen two populations further north seem relatively stable. It appears that they're opportunistic. They're they're these subpolar species, they've found new niches where there's not as much ice. And so as the population in the north is growing, uh, some of them end up trying to colonize new places. Um, there's a lot of discussion about, are the Gentoos directly competing with the Adelis? Why are the Gentoos doing better? Um, one hypothesis that we're working on is that the Gentoos are um, because they're not adapted to this harsh polar climate, they're more adaptable in their breeding season. For example, if conditions aren't, you know, they'll get to the island or their colony, if the conditions aren't right, they might delay egg laying until conditions improve. The Adelis are pretty time faithful. Um, we've started to do satellite tags on the Gen 2s as well to see where they're feeding. They have a somewhat different feeding strategy uh, than the Adelis, both in terms of location, but also in, in, in depth. And so we're not clear if that's actually beneficial yet, but that's one of the data sets that we're trying to collect. Have you found the Adelie population increasing anywhere else? So the Adelis are doing quite well um, in the Ross Sea. There's an enormous population in the Ross Sea the Ross Sea has actually been cooling for a number of, of years. Um, and when we first started, so the two big colonies that we've been measuring, one is up by the US base uh, to the north. The other is closer to the British base. Uh, they have a base called Rothera. Uh, and there's a colony on Avian Island near Rothera. Um, and that population for many years looked like it was actually growing. So this was this idea that you know, conditions are improving as you go down the peninsula. The last couple of years, it's been flattening. And so we're trying to figure out if that's going to start to decline. And even further south, um, and this is actually documented in the, in the movie, uh, the movie, the year they filmed the movie was the first year in many years that we were able to get to a colony on Sharko Island. Uh, we knew that there was a penguin colony there. Uh, but we just had never been able to get to it because the ice is pretty heavy and it's pretty far south. Um, and there, the colony actually is appears to be improving. So um, there's a limit to how far south the Adelis can go, though, um, because they are uh, they need light to, to uh, they're they're light driven predators. So if they have to go too far south, it's harder for them in the winter uh, because of polar night. Yeah. Are there historical records of the penguin populations? Like the, I mean, the usual <coughs> historical records of the whale populations. Right. So there were people there, obviously. Were they recording anything about the penguins? Um, so the whale records are commercial records. The whalers wanted to know where they took the whales because that's where they were going to go back to. There aren't nearly as many, because people weren't, unfortunately, because people weren't harvesting the penguins. Um, commercially, there are some scientific records, and then there are the these paleo uh, reconstructions of where the colonies were. Um, but yeah, the, 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 we don't have the data back into the you know 1920s on the penguins. So the year that the, the lavender stuff is there, whatever, not the krill, the other stuff. I can't remember the name. I apologize. The salts. The yeah. gelatinous. Yeah, so the, I'm assuming the humpback whale eats that? Um, so salps are these little gelatinous. They're, they're mostly water by biomass, by, by, by weight. Uh, they're not particularly nutritious. That's what I was talking and, about. and whales are not fond of salps. Um, actually, not much is fond of salps. <laughs> um, but don't laugh. In an evolutionary sense, we are closer to the salp than we are to the krill. <laughs> yes, um, I may have missed it, but with the glaciers melting more, the mm -hmm. salinity of the water, have you noticed a change 
and that in the um, Arctic, Antarctic. So um, here, here's a, a picture. All the blue dots, or black dots, I guess, in this figure, are the glaciers that are actually retreating. And the picture on the left is sort of showing one of the ways that we document that using satellite imagery. Um, has the melting of the ice affected the water column, the stability of the water column, because of the additional fresh water that's been added? Um, so far, we haven't been able to document that. One of the ways we've been doing it is looking at not just the salinity, but you can use the isotopes of oxygen to see where the fresh water comes from. So ice that falls as rain, or water that falls as, as snow or rain onto the, the glacier has a different isotopic composition than sea ice. And so we collect samples that are, uh, we work with a British colleague. Interestingly, although he's able to document that there's a lot more fresh water coming off the continents, uh, it looks like the increases in wind mixing are mixing that fresh water deeper in the water column. So we can see a glacial signal, we just, it, it's not showing up in the surface layer. The other question is, is if, these, I, if these glaciers are retreating faster, are we getting more iron? And we, we unfortunately, we have about three or four years of iron data. Um, it's really hard to make iron measurements. Um, and we just don't have a long enough time series yet to see if that's happening. Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe a little off topic, but I've been concerned about the question of oxygen. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I know the rainforest and Amazon was said to produce a lot of our oxygen, and a lot of it comes from the ocean, from these various little, mic I understand, microscopic sea creatures. And um, are, are, are we at sort of risk of losing our oxygen source between acidity in the ocean and the deforestation, right. or is this really a lot more, um, or is that, are there other sources and is it all very robust? So um, the reason why there's a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere is because at some point, somebody made some organic carbon that's been buried. And, and you've basically taken that carbon, that photosynthetic carbon, because the oxygen is produced by photosynthesis. So if you, if you produce oxygen by photosynthesis, if the carbon's still around, eventually that carbon will be oxidized, you'll lose the oxygen. So the reason why there's 20%, 21% oxygen in the atmosphere is this long-term storage of carbon through deep sediments. So there's enough oxygen in the atmosphere that you know I'm not concerned about oxygen declining enough that would have impact biologically. But actually, one of the things that some of my colleagues do is they make very precise measurements of oxygen in the atmosphere. And I showed earlier the plot of the carbon dioxide going up with time. You can actually see the oxygen going down. And that's one of the ways we figure out what's happened to the carbon, of whether that carbon has ended up going back into plant material. You know, some of the carbon doesn't stay in the atmosphere. Does it get taken up by other land plants? in which case there'd be oxygen put in the atmosphere, or does it dissolve in the ocean where it doesn't affect the oxygen? So yes, there was, I, I remember my colleague Ralph Keeling getting these very frantic calls after his first nature paper uh, from the White House. Oh my God, is this the great oxygen crisis? Um, he said, no, but I have this wonderful, beautiful data that you should be funding because it tells us a lot scientifically. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Scott, I'm, I'm wondering what your take home message is for us in terms of what we want to go and tell our neighbors and our friends and our family tomorrow. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm not trying to add. So the, the question is, what, what do you go home and tell your neighbors? What did you learn tonight? Um, I, I'm not trying to advocate, you know, I, 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 I'm not beating a drum in the sense that, you know, we are studying this both because we're trying to see are there impacts of climate change and can we learn something about how polar ecosystems work that might inform us about how other ocean ecosystems work. Um, I hope what I got across is that there are long-term trends. Um, some of them are because of climate. Some of them are because of you know, past events like whaling. 
Um, but it's a very complicated system. And there's lots of variations from year to year. Um, we think polar systems will evolve and will we'll experience climate change in a way that might be more dramatic than other spots. But I think the, the jury's still out um, on some of these issues. What you're supposed to do is go back and say, ocean gliders and drones are really cool. Let's buy one. <laughs> Would you like to go try and test your <laughs> yeah, last, last question. Um, so as this hydrologic connectivity with the land surfaces increases, um, and like different nutrients are being input into the system, like iron and others, have you seen any changes in the phytoplankton communities, like increases in other species besides diatoms? Or yeah. So, um, and this is going to get get a little geeky quickly. Um, so the way, um, so I've been using chlorophyll. And basically saying chlorophyll is phytoplankton, but there's you know, 20,000 or so species of phytoplankton, not counting the, the bacteria, which you know, what, is, what a bacteria species is is a whole other conversation. Um, we have some data on the size of the phytoplankton, and the phytoplankton appear to be getting smaller. And so if they get small, the krill can't eat them anymore. And so we've been doing some work where it looks like the, there's another layer of zooplankton that's coming in, the microzooplankton. And so what happens is the carbon that's produced by photosynthesis has to go through at least one more level of the trophic level. And so it decreases the efficiency. The other data we have is on pigments, so different types of phytoplankton. Um, in addition to chlorophyll, there's all these accessory pigments that they will grow. And we can actually use pigment data. It's not exact down to the species, but we see different types of what well, we used to see when there was a bloom, it was diatoms. Now we're seeing in the north um, a, a, a different groups of phytoplankton coming in and, and growing in. So it's a, it's, it's a really interesting topic. And one of my postdocs is working hard to try to see if she can pull out these pigment signatures from satellite data. So we could actually tell not only how much phytoplankton that was there, but what type of plankton is there. So I'll turn it back over to Billy. All right, well, let's give Scott another hand.